We will begin with a, uh, our keynote speaker, Mr. Hadiri, who's the Deputy Ambassador from Afghanistan to India. And then we're going to have two panels. The first will be on entrepreneurship, and the second will be on investing in Afghanistan. Our panelists have flown in from Kabul and Herat for this conference, and we're all very excited uh, to be here. So thank you. I bet many of you are wondering why the Department of Defense is at a conference on social impact investing. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I've got a lot of questions. Are we spies? What are we doing? Um, essentially, I mean, to the Department of Defense and specifically our group, the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations, is very concerned about stability in conflict zones. Um, we first had focused on Iraq and now we're solely focused on Afghanistan. And essentially, long term, what we are trying to do is create Stability, that's a very broad term, and we can discuss that more on the panel. But we think the key to long-term stability in these regions is a strong, vibrant, and legitimate private sector. We've spent the majority of our time on our, on our program focusing on the SME sectors. SMEs are particularly important for stability. Uh, they have a more diffused power structure, and SMEs often are not trying to rent-seek from the government, but they're trying to have um, a legitimate and fair business environment so that they can operate. And then in the long term, they're able to put pressure on governments, uh, specifically in Afghanistan, um, to, to be um, accountable. And over the long term, that's, that's vital. We have a few, um, we've looked at, in the SME sector, about 700 companies. We have a team, some of whom are here today. Um, and essentially, we're looking for companies that are the gems. Afghanistan's already a niche market, so we're looking for the best of the best firms. Uh, we're looking to match those local firms with international lending institutions and responsible investors. And we say, how do we get people to yes? Uh, it's a difficult thing. It, typically, there's a lot of transaction costs, especially in a place like Afghanistan. So we try and just make it easier for all parties. We don't give grants. What we do is we essentially do the due diligence. Uh, we can track down information for the investors. So if you're in the audience and you're interested in investing, you're interested in, in having your NGO expand into Afghanistan, um, into a, a fund, either commercial or seed, uh, we are here to help. We have a business accelerator um, that we've been operating with IBM and Google, um, primarily IBM, um, in Herat for a couple of years, and we are now building one at the American University of Afghanistan. We're attaching a seed capital fund to that, and we're structuring that right now. It's going to be a public-private partnership. The U.S. government's obviously put a lot of money into Afghanistan, as, um, as a lot of other nations have as well, and so we're trying to have long-term success as we start to leave. So there's certainly uh, resources available, um, financial, and just pure, pure bandwidth. Um, so we, again, we want to make it easy for everyone. So a lot of the firms who are here today are some of the gems which we found. They're looking for investment. Um, if you know anyone who would be interested, um, they can provide you information. We can provide you information. And again, we're just trying to make it easy for everybody. So let us know um, what you would like to do, and we can, we can help. To begin, our... Our, um, our spotlight, I'd like to introduce you to the Deputy Ambassador from Afghanistan to India. Uh, Mr. Hadiri has consistently engaged in public diplomacy throughout his career with a focus on great instability and reconstruction in Afghanistan. Prior to his current position, he served as Deputy Assistant National Security Advisor from 2004 to 2011. Mr. Hadiri served in the Embassy of Afghanistan in the U.S. in various capacities. He's also worked at the U.N., uh, for the High Commission for Refugees and for the World Food Program. He holds a Master of Arts from the Foreign Service School of Georgetown, and he holds a bachelor's degree from Wabash College. He has been published widely um, in Washington Post, Hindu, Hindustan Times, um, New York Times, Boston Globe, and speaks regularly in academia and um, in public forums. Please welcome Mr. Hadir. Thank you very much for that uh, kind and generous uh, introduction, distinguished panelists who will be here, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, truly honored by the uh, invitation to participate in uh, uh, this year's Sankalp Unconvention Summit on Looking Beyond Impact, Seeking Transformational uh, Change, a topic that resonates well with a decade of transformation which we're looking forward to in Afghanistan following the end of the transition period in 2014. Before discussing these vital issues of importance 
to Afghanistan's long-term stabilization and development. Please allow me to thank the U.S. Department of Defense Task Force for Business and Stability Operations for organizing today's uh, session on Afghanistan and for inviting me to share with you our view um, on the critical effect, impact, investment can have on Afghanistan and our population of what I call vulnerable groups. I'm especially grateful to Mr. Albert Bosar, Ms. Amina Osmoni, and their colleagues for their tireless efforts, helping us ensure that public and private institutions in the region and beyond are informed of the many investment opportunities in Afghanistan's virgin markets. Indeed, our gathering today is a manifestation of America's firm commitment to helping secure the future of Afghanistan as the people and government of Afghanistan desire and have striven to move away from dependence on foreign aid to private sector led the growth and economic self-reliance in the coming years. In the same vein, I would like to thank our Indian partners for leading international efforts to help Afghanistan realize our full economic potential. Based on the outcomes of the Istanbul process and last year's Kabul ministerial meeting of the heart of Asia countries, India is leading the implementation of Chambers of Commerce CBM or Confidence Building Measure and Commercial Opportunity as CBM. These are major efforts uh, at a regional level aimed at further enhancing confidence and trust among Afghanistan and our near and extended neighbors through cross-border trade, transit, and investment. We appreciate this and other regional economic cooperation initiatives which India has supported to facilitate trade and investment in Afghanistan. In complex post-conflict environments such as Afghanistan, security and development needs are intertwined. Without addressing both at the same time, it would be hard to ensure an enabling environment for sustainable economic growth. In other words, bullets alone cannot remedy our situation. In fact, it is the economy is stupid, as President Clinton once said, and that's even relevant in the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan. As you know, a large number of the Taliban foot soldiers who former ISAF Commander General David Petraeus used to call $10 a day Taliban are non-ideological and have resorted to violence in the absence of a sustainable livelihood to support themselves and their families. Many of these rental fighters can and should be weaned off the battlefield by providing them with a sustainable um, income. Therefore, it is more jobs for our youthful population in urban and rural Afghanistan that can ensure durable stability in the country. And those jobs should be sustainable in a productive economy, since we know from many lessons learned that employment created through quick fixes, like cash for work projects, has only temporarily addressed what remains Afghans' top need and concern even before security threats and their concerns. And a final analysis, short-term job creating measures are sure to fail unless they are geared towards promoting and facilitating sustainable income generation in the Afghan economy. And frankly speaking, Afghanistan has turned into the mecca of quick fixes or quick fix failures over the past 12 years even though more than $50 billion in donor assistance has so far been spent to help stabilize and rebuild Afghanistan. Of course, this massive cost does not include international military expenditure, which is accounted or amounted to over $100 billion a year since 2001. So that's why we immensely welcome any efforts by the international community, including today's effort, to support sustainable job creation initiatives in Afghanistan. And that can only be achieved through investment, 
be it purely for profit or for specific impact targets, solving an array of social problems at the base of the pyramid. Ladies and gentlemen, Afghanistan is one of the neediest countries for impact investment. Some 70% of our 35 million population are below the age of 25, a vast majority of whom are the breadwinners of large households with additional dependents as war widows and children. And because Afghans began working from an early age, which I did when I was only barely 12, to support their families that are resilient and enterprising. And some, at a relatively young age, despite a high rate of illiteracy, they constitute a responsible, energetic, and industrious workforce. But unfortunately, they lack access to skill development opportunities, capital, and credit to grow their small and medium-sized businesses which largely operate in Afghanistan's vast informal economy. Impact investment opportunities abound in every sector in Afghanistan. Last June, at the Daily Investment Summit on Afghanistan, our Ministry of Commerce and Industries presented a detailed list of investment opportunities in Afghanistan, which is available online, and I encourage you to get a copy for your further information. At the summit, we informed some 320 participating business representatives from Afghanistan, the region, and beyond of 25 different markets for investment in the following sectors, energy, minerals, transport, agriculture, small and medium-sized industries, ICTs, finance, health services, in construction. With the exception of a few domestic and for, uh, foreign first movers in each of these sectors and their related markets, most of them remain underinvested. The government of Afghanistan, in partnership with our allies, frequently encourages regional and international investors to visit Afghanistan and see the countless highly profitable investment opportunities for themselves. Last November, President Karzai focused his state visit to India, encouraging the Indian business community to explore investment opportunities in Afghanistan. Meeting with a group of business leaders here in Mumbai, the President even promised to roll out a red carpet for major Indian firms if they made a move to enter Afghanistan's virgin markets. Ladies and gentlemen, our ties with India are civilizational. India is the first country in the region with which we signed a strategic partnership agreement in 2011. A major part of the agreement focuses on Indian commitment to Afghanistan's socio-economic development, enabling us to achieve self-realize on the long run. To that end, India is the largest non-traditional donor to Afghanistan has delivered $2 billion in highly effective and visible assistance to the country. We count on the continued multi-dimensional assistance of India beyond the transition period into the transformation decade, uh, starting from 2014 to the end of 2024, and renew our call on the Indian social entrepreneurs and impact investors to share with us their vast exp expertise and experiences to address the problem of abject poverty in Afghanistan through the many poor successful business models they have deployed in India. And of course, they are most welcome to invest for impact in Afghanistan themselves. And at the same time, in the spirit of North-South-South cooperation, we call upon our allies and friends in the developed world such as the United States, to support India's public and private efforts aimed at the long-term economic development of Afghanistan. And I think today is a small manifestation of such results-oriented cooperation, which Afghanistan only needs more of in the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that most investors care, about, care to know about the business environment in Afghanistan. A security and governance are two of the key 
enablers for any business to flourish. Insecurity and weak governance do actually undermine business efforts and put investments at risk. Like most post-conflict countries, Afghanistan is not free of these challenges, which we continue confronting and addressing in partnership with the international community. But please allow me to assure you that in, this, in, the, in spite of the very sensationally negative news reports on Afghanistan, mostly from the West, we have made monumental gains in building the military and civilian institutions of the state based on one of the most progressive constitutions in the region, which provides for a private sector-led economy. I'm pleased to let you know that the World Bank's 2013 Doing Business Index ranks Afghanistan 28 out of 185 countries in establishing a business in the country. This has been made possible by the Afghanistan Investment Support Agency, or ISA, which serves as a one-stop shop for investors, foreign and domestic, for easily registering and establishing a business in Afghanistan within a couple of weeks. And over the past 12 years, we've enacted a number of commercial and investment laws, including the company law, consumer protection law, competition law, partnership law, and arbitration law, among others. These laws have streamlined many of the problems associated with Afghanistan's farmer centrally planned economy. However, there are times when a lack of institutional capacity, and that's key, lack of institutional capacity because that capacity has not been given to us over the past 12 years, prevents us from implementing and enforcing these laws, meeting most of the international business and investment standards. But these bottlenecks can be addressed through consulting firms or joint ventures with successful, reliable Afghan firms, some of which are present here, and their representatives will speak to you on the upcoming panel. As far as security, there are only a handful of districts, mostly in the south and east of Afghanistan, where it is hard to do business. Much of the rest of Afghanistan is secure for business and investment. I'm sure the panelists will share their first-hand experiences in starting businesses in the south and east of Afghanistan, let alone, of course, in the north and west, where many domestic and foreign startups have flourished within a few years. Ladies and gentlemen, Afghanistan is a trade hub connecting the Indian subcontinent with Central Asia the Middle East, and China, a region that includes some of the fastest growing economies in the world, and we are right at the heart of it. Also, our location makes Afghanistan a national locus for an emerging regional network of trade routes and pipelines. The ease of competition and the ample potential for, for growth in Afghanistan are relatively new developments. For the first time in decades, Afghanistan enjoys the most investment-friendly environment in the region. The people of Afghanistan see these new opportunities as a way to rebuild our homeland. We are proud of our historical tradition of commerce and cultural exchange dating back 2,000 years ago to the era of the Silk Road. With each economic opportunity that is fulfilled, the people of Afghanistan move one step closer to reconnecting with our heritage and securing a good future for our country. Afghan and uh, foreign investors can and should play a major role in helping us, uh, the Afghan people, of course, fulfill our national destiny. Thank you very much, and with that, I look forward to your questions. Any questions? No? Okay. That makes my job easy. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, just take this one. Okay. So we're going to begin now with the entrepreneurial panel. Um, could everyone please come up to the stage?
things on. Okay, so we have um, four Afghan, or three Afghan entrepreneurs, and Amna actually works with us, uh, and she can provide often a, a, a woman's perspective on Afghanistan, which is very different, I think, as most people can imagine. Um, Amna Asmani, uh, as we have Walid, um, we have Shakur, um, I, I can never say your name properly, uh, Kazazada. Uh, and then we have Dave McCoy, who's been in Afghanistan for 11 years, uh, he's from LA originally. It'd be useful for each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, the, the opportunity to be here. I grew up in Afghanistan, and uh, when Taliban took over, my family and I uh, left Afghanistan and went to Pakistan. I lived in Pakistan and in the U.S. as a refugee for an extended amount of time. I uh, pursued my higher education and worked in various fields in, in the U.S. And then I was presented with the opportunity to come back to Afghanistan and work hand-in-hand -hand with small and medium-sized uh, inter uh, entrepreneurs. I took that opportunity very immediately. I've been in Afghanistan for two and a half years. Um, uh, it has been a great, uh, great experience for me, um, and I can speak to the challenges that Afghan women face and the changes that have came in the past 12 years. So, thank, thank you. you. Wally? Amina was also his translator. Uh, Mr. Walid Fakiri is the manager of logistics and procurement for Herat Ice Cream Company. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Shakur? Yeah, my name is Shakur Kazada. Uh, I was born in Afghanistan uh, during the Soviet War, uh, Mujahideen and Russian. We left Afghanistan. Uh, was living in different countries. Finally, a couple of years, I, I was living in Denmark. In 2003, we came back uh, from Denmark to Afghanistan. I started working with different organizations and uh, foreigner and Afghan, uh, military and civilian. So finally in, 2000, uh, in 2011, we decided to have our own company in Afghanistan and bring something new which uh, will be different from other companies or typical local companies. So we brought uh, a new technology to Afghanistan. Uh, we, we call our company or ourselves the, the first e-payment company in Afghanistan, or uh, uh, Express Pay. <clears throat> so we, we was, uh, start the company. We start the company with 2%. Uh, 2011, now we are 157 uh, uh, people working in a company in one compound uh, in, in Afghanistan. Excellent. Yeah. And Dave? Yeah, uh, originally from Los Angeles, uh, after September 11th happened, uh, me and a few buddies said, how are we going to respond to this? And we decided, well, let's go make a difference. Um, so spent many years uh, in the nonprofit sector and just recently moved over to the private sector. Uh, really believing that in the transition period for Afghanistan, it's, it's going to be the, the private sector and the small to medium-sized enterprises that are really going to help with stability. Um, so I, I'm representing First Rate Afghanistan, which is an American-backed uh, software technology company that really is in Afghanistan to invest in the technology industry uh, through knowledge transfer, through job creation, and through creating sustainable techno technological solutions for the Afghan government and the private sector. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm very happy to be here today. Great. Let's continue on the technological topic. Uh, Shakur, why don't you talk a little bit about your experiences, and especially how a technology company like yours can really help um, those who are the poorest in Afghanistan. As I say, when we were uh, thinking to bring a new, new, new uh, technology in Afghanistan to help the Af Afghanistan people and uh, our our business as well. So the e-payment solution which we brought to Afghanistan, uh, right now we have uh, uh, more than 12 projects working on them and uh, 
we are connecting uh, connecting with the system uh, most of the uh, our employees uh, young generation uh, they are working with us the ladies uh, working with us we have a very good call center uh, which is uh, we uh, it has a free shift especially women working on that one and uh, in our financial department, the women's working there. And also, we have a very good opportunities for the university students. When it uh, doesn't matter when they are coming to the office, we hire them for the uh, marketing. So we give them training. Uh, it does, uh, some of them coming, they have different shifts. Some of them coming uh, uh, 12 o'clock uh, afternoon or uh, 1 o'clock, some of them coming in the morning. So they are working in the, in the market for us. Uh, uh, like uh, they can go to university and they can help their families. Also, our company is, uh, is giving chance to very small business from the large city to the villages for the people who run a small shop or a content. Uh, they, can, uh, they can have our product uh, and they, they, they're making their lives and they, they cover uh, uh, their, their financials. So our company is uh, uh, doing the e-payment e solutions in Afghanistan, as I say. Uh, but also we are, uh, we are doing, we are working with the microfinance bank. Microfinance bank giving credit to the people of Afghanistan to very small businesses. Uh, from hundred dollar, I can say to a couple of thousand dollar, but the people has to supposed to bring back the money monthly back to the bank. The bank doesn't have a lot of branches to Afghanistan, uh, and the people coming from 30, 40 kilometers to pay back the money, it cost them uh, their time, money, transport, and uh, they spend one day, and also their money. So now. They don't need to go to the bank or to the branch of the bank. And if there is our, uh, uh, our kiosk, they go to our kiosk, uh, put deposit money back to the, to the kiosk, it, it goes to the bank. And the second uh, businesses, which is very large, it, it covering a uh, large uh, number of, of the poor people, is uh, ear top up selling through the a comment we have, we call it USSD. Uh, with a very simple telephone that don't need uh, internet and not uh, too much power. So the people can use that one uh, and they, they, normally they're making some money for their life. That's right. Dave, can you talk a little bit about the, the technological changes you've seen in Afghanistan since, since you entered the country? Yeah, I mean, if we, if we can compare Afghanistan prior to 2001, uh, I mean, kids couldn't go to school, they couldn't get on the internet, they, they didn't even know what a computer is. One of my employees, his first day of university as a computer science student, didn't even know how to turn on a computer. Um, nowadays, Afghans are resilient in building technological solutions. I mean, uh, the e-payment solution is a brilliant way to make a huge social impact. One is through the payments of microfinance loans, but also, um, as many of you know, in, in developing countries, um, and especially post-war, post-conflict countries, Corruption is a major issue. Um, well, many of many solutions through technology allows to kind of sidestep that corruption branch and allow people to pay directly what they are owed for uh, medical bills, for electrical bills, for water bills, for all those things. So technology has now brought in solutions for the poor and the, the common people to allow them to not be um, Look, uh, not be penalized for their their, their state of poverty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amina, can you you've you've actually evaluated a lot of the companies for us. When you go into to firms, what are the things that you think really makes a, a good Afghan entrepreneur? It's probably true for m most environments like this, the real pre frontier ones. Very true. Yes, uh, definitely. We've been to what seven hundred companies or so. Um, from what you can see, I think the Afghan entrepreneurs. Uh, ones who are ahead of the curve. Uh, they, they know the change, they realize that they realize that they live in a very uncertain situation in, 
and they're ready for it. They know their opportunities and also the challenges. So they're street smart, opportunistic, and uh, they're go-getters. Well, your, your company is very much like that. Can you talk a little bit about um, the challenges that you faced going to now a fairly large um, agricultural-based firm? Me? I've gone from. So Herod, I started very small. We started with uh, processing almost uh, from uh, 50 kilos of milk per day, and now we have expanded it. We ex we started with about 15 people or 20 people at our office, and now we have. Uh, they have about 350 pe uh, people directly working with them at their factory or companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indirectly or through their distribution uh, services. Um, they have um, basically, they are employing or creating income for more than 10,000 families. They have women who milk the cows, uh, milk comes to their processing center. And also they have ice cream carts, about 3,000 of them all around the country. Um, and those, um, very, these are very small businesses. Anyone with a, about less than amount of $100 can have an ice cream cart, which can uh, produce an income of uh, about $20 uh, per day for them, which is pretty good for Afghanistan. Um, so that's uh, basically where they are. That's what you said about Chuala Shua, you know, that has the different countries. And uh, also, the, some of the challenges that Afghan entrepreneurs, especially Herat ice cream, faces is the uh, customs, borders, everything has to be almost uh, the raw material that they need for their production or ice cream packaging has to come through the border. Sometimes it's not uh, very efficient or on a timely manner. However, they have been able to create a system where they're um, able to have a sustainable uh, products or inventory and uh, go forward with it. So. That's great. Yeah, everyone likes ice cream in the Taliban. <laughs> yes. So Afghanistan's economy has actually been, people don't realize, overheated for years. Um, I mean, I think it's tripled in GDP more than triple over the last 10 years. And at one point, it was running at 18% 2011, about 11% last year. What do um, each of you see as projections over the next five years? A lot of people are concerned with the drawdown and the elections in Afghanistan. Dave? Um. I mean, the influx of aid has been um, very prosperous for many Afghans um, and many Afghan companies, as well as many international companies. Um, but uh, on the downside, it's really created a dependency and a get today because you don't know if you'll be able to get tomorrow mentality. Um, it's also inflated a lot of um, businesses that don't really have sustainable business plans or um, strategies for a long-term solution. Um, but I really believe that Afghan companies and Afghan entrepreneurs know exactly where they're at. And they've faced many more challenges than you and I have ever faced. And they're very optimistic that, um, you know, that come 2014, the transition isn't going to phase them. They're, they're going to be ready to go, and, and they're already planning for the transition and re-strategizing for their businesses post the transition. So you've, you've gotten married and had a kid since? I've gotten are you married. Gonna, are you going to stay in Afghanistan? Uh, we are. We're still there. We're, we are hoping to see the transi transition through and, um, yeah, see First Rate Afghanistan continue to be a long-term long, long -term partner for, for the technology industry. That's great. And Shakur, what do you see as the, the growth areas over the next five years? Uh, Besides your company. Basically, uh, I think 
what the Afghan people learned. Uh, I can say Af Afghanistan started from zero. There was nothing 12 years before. Uh, totally was nothing. Uh, we, in, in 12 years, we learned a lot from Americans, friends, and international friends, uh, neighbors, uh, especially good specialists of uh, India and India, uh, Indian people, which we have a lot of uh, uh, experience and specialists uh, about the IT and technology from these people. Uh, now, I think this is the time we use, we need to use our experience and energy to build up. Uh, I, I can see a good, uh, good future, inshallah, for Afghanistan and uh, United States and international friends. Uh, they spend a lot in Afghanistan. Uh, they spend their time, their money. Uh, uh, I think they, they will not leave Afghanistan. Uh, maybe one thing will be changed, uh, which is the military go out from Afghanistan, but the specialists come into Afghanistan uh, with the business management, investment, uh, and more, uh, more uh, good information according to the, to the Afghan culture after, after 2014 or in the next uh, five years. Makes sense. Well, Af Afghanistan has the youngest population on the planet. Average age is around 17, uh, which means it's a growing market. It's good for ice cream. How do you, um, how do you imagine working with your supply chain? Right now, um, it, it seems like you have very innovative ways from getting um, your raw materials from, from farmers. So uh, the way that the Herat ice cream works is that they have um, created their own collection centers in villages around uh, their factory area. Uh, so the farmer, uh, the farmer has who has only one cow or only a couple of cows, they can get the milk, take it to the collection center, and from the collection center, it's processed, collected, and brought into the city by Herat ice cream staff. A few things that have happened around um, in this process, it has increased the number of farmers who want to take part in this. Um, they don't need to have a large farm of, uh, you know, a uh, dairy farm in order to operate. They know that only one or two cows, they can have the milk processed and it's easily for, it's sold. Uh, the, their income is guaranteed. It will not uh, spoil because they were not, they didn't have the time to go to the city that day. Um, they know that very easily in a very short amount of time they can get the milk to the center and uh, collect their money. This has in, um, actually encouraged farming in Afghanistan. In, in the beginning, they had a uh, shortage of uh, basic, basically milk, uh, but now they're able to collect about 15 tons of milk per day, and, um, and they see the numbers increasing. Cool. Thanks. And Amina, from um, what do you see the future of, of? A lot of people are concerned about women in Afghanistan and their future. Do you, how do you envision that, and do you see a difference in a place like Kabul, which is grown from under a million to roughly five million today versus rural areas and um, what can be done in the social impact in the world? Actually, I think the change has been positive. If you compare Afghanistan today to Afghanistan 12 years ago, the presence of women was minimal. I mean, uh, look at the education center, media, uh, education system, media, um, agriculture, saffron growing. Uh, so. Nowadays, you see a higher number of women involved in service industry, IT industry, fashion industry, which is, I'm happy about, <laughs> Zafran, um, and also media. Um, and I think the change is positive, and it's, it's coming, and it's becoming more of a cultural change now, more than just something from outside. It's, people are believing in the change. They see the uh, 
the profit that comes from it. A woman coming outside has, um, has an income which helps the family. And as uh, Mr. Haidari mentioned, we have a large number of widows and orphans in the country. So when the mother is able to work, that creates income for the family. And that's, that's positive. That has changed the country for the better. I think you should start a frontier fashion line. Afghan cashmere. There's an <laughs> article in the New York Times. An expert said it had soul. So if you want to get a cashmere, we can, we can hook you up with a supplier. That sounds good, yes. I, I'm a big supporter of that. So. so I think we'll open it up to questions. You can ask anything broad, narrow, specific to the companies, our work, Afghanistan's economy. I'll leave it to you. That's a great question. Um, I think with everything, it depends. So Afghan Pharma, um, ha I'm sorry, Afghan, Afghan Pharma is there. <laughs> um, but Harad Ice Cream um, ha has been there for, for some time. They haven't left, where Shakur left and he came back. So I mean, it really depends. Um, and we obviously, there's, there's obviously a lot of rural firms. Um, but I think a lot of these parts of the world, the growth is in the cities. So I mean, Kabul's a great example. It had a million, under a million in 2001. It's five today, and it's going to have about eight million in seven years. And so the numbers are just staggering how people moving to cities, um, they need jobs. So we, I mean, that's where a lot of the growth is, but then obviously there's still opportunities. I don't know, what do you think? Um, I absolutely agree with you. I think the growth is in the urban areas more, but rural areas too, you see growth in farming. Uh, for example, saffron growth, um, dairy farming, um, also Kashmir, you mentioned, that's, that's taking off, it's pretty good. Um, and then and heavier industries, I think, then entrepreneurs are mostly um, Afghans or manufacturers, you know, talking about um, steel or other um, heavy industries. So it, it's a mixture. It depends on the skill sets required for the task. Shakur, what are your thoughts on that? This one has come back. Uh, according to my idea, the, the, the people of Afghanistan who have been outside Afghanistan for a long time, but still, they had a they had a feeling for their countries. Uh, as an example, if I if I talk about myself, when I returned back to Afghanistan, I start working uh, with the U.S. Special Force in Bagram Base. But one day we were sitting uh, with them and talking about the uh, Afghan people and their poor life. Uh, from the village uh, I come from. Uh, I was explaining to my general, I told him that village is uh, 700 people living in that village, but they don't have a water. They are drinking drought water uh, during the summer and, and winter. It's very difficult. They're going like half kilometers to bring the water, especially the women and children is doing that. So could you help on that one? The general told me, uh, what, what can I do? I told him, you bring the, the pipeline to these people or we can... Uh, we can uh, uh, drill a wheel. He told me, yes, go and talk with the people to the village, which one they like. When I go to them and, and, and talk to them, they say the, the pipeline is very far. It's going to cost you too much, but we can, uh, uh, if you can drill a wheel here. So we did that one. I mean, I, I give you this example. If a person has a feeling and uh, they, they return to Afghanistan back, of course, they are trying to develop Afghanistan. And we did that, that one, and this is exactly seven years, those people, uh, eight years, drinking water from that uh, wheel, 158 meters down. We, we, uh, we drill a wheel for them, and it paid by, by the fund from U.S. Army, but my general, I was working for him. It's the same things. We did a lot of uh, small, small things in Afghanistan. And, uh, the people who come... From outside, they bring very good ideas and they bring a knowledge. Uh, by the help of their friends, they did something. Yes. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Good. Okay, this is Hemant here. Uh, just wanted to find out. Uh, it's a great thing that people come back with ideas and create businesses. But I want to know what the people who are growing in Afghanistan, maybe 15-year-old, 17-year-old, 20-year-old uh, graduates who are graduating out of the college. 
what are they looking for as a career opportunity? Is entrepreneurship as an opportunity there? Or what, what is the thinking in youth in Afghanistan? Let's take that. Who's the youngest person on the stage? I am, of okay. course. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think there are opportunities. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to translate the question. Um, I would say that the majority of young people um, grow up in a business entrepreneur setting. Most of, the, most of their fathers or uncles have shops. They're selling material, food, um, vegetables, whatever it may be. And they've been grown up in the shop helping their father or their uncle sell what they're selling. Um, so they've grown up in an entrepreneurial setting. Um, the, I think because of this influx of aid, not just in the last 10 years, the 12 years, but really over the last 30 years. I mean, there's been war in the last 30, 40 years of Afghanistan. They have this idea that money has to come from the outside in one aspect. And so a lot of them are waiting for a handout. But there are many entrepreneurial young Afghans who have started new technology companies, have started new logistics companies, have started so many new initiatives um, to create jobs for themselves as well as for their, their cousins, their friends, um, and their families. Um, so I, I think a lot of them are, are looking to the outsiders who are coming back in, but also looking for creative ideas to solve their, their problems in their own families because of the environment they've grown up in. They've, they've known they've had to learn how to survive. Um, so it's kind of both and. Some of them are, are looking for handouts, but some of them are very ingenuitive and, and creative. And I'm gonna, what do you think about educated Afghan women, women who are graduating from university? What are they looking for as their future? I think there are different sectors. I mean, coming back to Afghanistan has been, I mean, you have a number of Fulbrighters who go to the U.S. So there when they come back, they, they see the need for the change. You have uh, young women in the parliament. You have them in business sectors. Uh, they're getting involved. I think they're not afraid to voice up their opinion and uh, step up in the business uh, world, which is like mainly a owned by men, so it's, uh, you see the increase, you see the encouragement, also you see the, uh, that women are very eager to enter into that sector and work. Right now there is a lot of opportunities for the women who go to university or, or finish a school. Uh, 10 or 12 years before, in all Afghanistan, we had only one university, it was a government, uh, government uh, university, but now we have a more than uh, more than 60 universities in Afghanistan and in the provinces. The, the same like uh, clinic and hospital. We had a only, before we had a only the hospitals belongs to the government. Now clinic, the telecommunications. In the telecommunications company, a lot of women uh, working there. There is opportunities to work uh, with, uh, with these kind of companies. There is, there is a space for, uh, for working, for job in Afghanistan, but we don't have a still specialists for uh, to occupy the positions in, in different uh, companies or, or in the government. Still, we have the advisor, the specialists, the, the uh, uh, engineers, ITs from other countries. Uh, we have we have a lot of. Experience. That's a great answer. It's definitely a, a big skills gap, um, especially for sectors that are taking off. I think we have time for one more question before we go to the next panel. Is this good? Yes. I love Afghani raisins. Oh. I also have tremendous fruit. <laughs> you also have semi-precious stones. Yes. You have good stuff. But I hear, from what I hear, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the question. You can't put a large plant to cut the stones, etc., because those people say they're afraid that the competing warlord will blow it up. So the investment is not coming. But then on the other hand, I know Roshan, is it Roshan, uh, Roshan. Uh, cell phone? Yes. He somehow went national. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? Why is it some people are afraid, some people can go national? I think that's a great question. It's very sector specific. Why you'd want to answer that? Why? Um, 
should let's have um, Dave, you want to take a shot? Yep. Um, I think um, one of the challenges with, Ro I mean, Roshan is a, a great, great example of a, a very successful company. Um, I think in regards to the industry of uh, mining and precious stones, um, a very cautious approach needs to be taken at a community level. If you get a community buy-in, then you won't necessarily need to worry about the warlords um, because the commu community really own, owns it and they'll protect it. Afghans are warriors at heart and they'll, they'll fight for something that they, they take ownership of. And that's what Afghan entrepreneurs are, are known for. They take ownership of what they own. And so in regards to the precious stones and all the resources that Afghanistan does have, it, it's going to take uh, some cautious movements in, at the community level to, to, for them to buy into, the, buy into it and have part ownership of it for the development of that, those specific industries. Yeah, I think that's a good, great answer. And, and we could talk about um, minerals and, and the future all day and, and how you set up a proper system. But maybe we can continue that with the next panel, which will be on investing. Uh, so thank you. Yes, Excellent. Thank you. As entrepreneurs to have a, a back and forth about some of the barriers that exist um, broadly in people's mindsets because of what is generally put on the, the newspapers. Um, I think what you'll find is nobody, nobody doubts that Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries um, and nobody doubts that much of what we talked about at this conference and social impact is relevant to Afghanistan. More of a mechanism in any emerging market, how you can actually leverage that capital and what are the concerns of investors which typically revolve around some level of return even though I put a premium on the social return and the protectment of that capital so that it ultimately can be deployed again. So the gentleman that I have, uh, Mr. Shakur, you've already met, uh, I won't reintroduce him, uh, but Ahmad here has been doing um, financial investments in Afghanistan. He works for Afghan Financial Services which is really uh, an on-the-ground nuts and bolts uh, operation that has a wealth of experience. He has both international and, and direct Afghan experience over the years and brings a great context and lens for the challenges that investors face and his obligation to provide that due diligence. Um, Wahid, uh, Wahid works for, for a very interesting company that we've had a long partnership with. Um, Wahid is a special project officer for Afghan Pharma which is the only sales and distribution company of basic health care and pharmaceutical needs uh, throughout all 34 provinces in Afghanistan. Uh, the company was started um, before the Taliban has operated during the Taliban years. Um, the new project that Wahid is undertaking for Afghan Pharma is they are investing in a dried fruits and nuts facility in Herat, uh, sor sourced locally. Uh, it's a good example of not only meeting the needs of people by being one of the few organizations that can actually provide basic health care products at low costs um, throughout all of Afghanistan, the poorest regions, but also in re-leveraging those earnings and putting it into um, uh, an agribusiness that is really driven by local farmers. So all of the fruits and nuts, and if anybody has knows the history of Afghanistan, um, pomegranates, uh, melons, fruits, nuts, olives, historically have all been uh, one of its best exports. So this is a case where his products are sourced locally from farmers, produced in Herat, and can be sold and exported um, throughout the world. So I think looking at how his company has done that is a, is a great lens as well. What we'd like to do is have a little bit of dialogue back and forth and then let you ask questions about them um, because we know that generally investors in bringing capital in uh, have those questions. Um, so Ahmad, I would like to ask you the first question and really I'd like to get your take on what you feel has been the investment environment in Afghanistan the last few years and how you see it uh, lining up with uh, what has been the general uh, conversation of this um, conference about impact investment and um, really targeted bottom of the pyramid. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for the introduction and thanks for the um, invitation to this wonderful event. 
Um, Afghanistan as a developing economy, of course, uh, every little thing we do as in the private sector has a positive impact, whether it's just you know, creating jobs or, or bringing a new industry into Afghanistan or just bringing you know, the basic needs uh, industry in Afghanistan um, is definitely uh, has a positive impact. Uh, the, the sectors that I, that, that I, that I think about that, that really has an impact as well as has opportunities for investors, especially in the uh, last, say, five years, uh, education was mentioned earlier, agricultural business, uh, you know, we have partnered up with Task Force on that, actually. We're creating the first ever uh, commodities exchange for Afghanistan, um, and we hope to be able to help farmers, both locally, um, get their products uh, and exposure to the, to, to, the, to the markets, as well as, uh, you know, bring in some market stability. Uh, capacity building, for example, in, in, in the farming industry, um, uh, um, aviation, mining has, has, is massive in Afghanistan, hasn't really started yet, but there are tons of opportunities. A lot of firms um, from the international community, including India, has been looking at Afghanistan for a lot of different opportunities in those sectors. So the environment is, you know, as, as we say, we're open for business and there are tons of um, opportunities, especially for impact investors. Uh, with very small amount of investment, they can make a massive uh, uh, impact. Plus, we're talking about returns. Uh, studies show that impact investment has better, if not at, at least, the same market return as other investments. So, tons of opportunities, absolutely. Great. Um, Wahid, I, I know it's generally uh, a topic on everybody's mind, but looking at, uh, you know, when an investment happens, there's obviously an investor on the other side that's looking for a return. Um, and want to protect their assets. Uh, how do you see security and how do you um, feel it impact your operations both in the standing up of your new dried fruits facility as well as your existing operation which those cash flows are necessary to support it as it grows? Okay. Uh, hi, Salaam Alaikum and I say Namaskar. Uh, I didn't have time to introduce but he did it. It's okay. Uh, well, uh, we had the same questions. Actually, it uh, connects to the same uh, question. Uh, we, we, I'll go a little uh, bit background to our company. Uh, our company is uh, operational in all over Afghanistan uh, with 72 agencies or distributing uh, points uh, with 720 staff members, uh, which, are, uh, which 200 of them are uh, medical doctors and uh, a mixture of female and male employees and around 11 international employee, uh, employees. Uh, well, uh, to, uh, looking to, uh, into a business which is all over Afghanistan and is operational since two, two and a half decades now, uh, uh, you will, uh, I'm sure, have the question how it works and how it has been operational. Uh, as uh, as, as uh, you see in developing country and post-conflict -con countries, uh, usually people uh, are more concerned on how to fix the country and how to build the country uh, other, rather than thinking on how to uh, go back to the war or uh, bring the conflict back. Uh, so uh, what uh, we have uh, done so far, we have, you know, uh, at the beginning, we involved the community itself in each project. If, if the project is in Kandahar, we have involved the Kandahar uh, reputa reputated uh, uh, businessman in, in our operation so that he can take care of the operation if uh, the... Uh, if the uh, if in any case, uh, if the situation is going wrong or it's secure or insecure. The products we are involved are healthcare and pharmaceutical products, which are the basic needs of the people, like food and the education. And for, for pharmaceutical and healthcare products are the basic needs. So people, in order to reach their basic needs, they have to protect that basic need. And uh, so the, this way we have tried to uh, 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 educate people that in case, uh, in order to have the uh, best uh, base, uh, to, to, ac to have access to your basic needs, you should protect your basic needs. And uh, the, the people from each province, from each location, we have involved the community itself. And uh, on the other hand, the government uh, itself, uh, they're, they're backing up our, uh, the, the companies and uh, the, the uh, international uh, community also, they're backing up. Uh, they are at, the, at, at our backside, and they are taking care of the uh, projects, like Afghan Pharma projects. And uh, this is why a project uh, stays secure and uh, lasts more. 
great. Thanks, Wahid. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of along those, Shakur, uh, how do you see business changing um, and, you know, it will price in how investors see things as 2014 approaches? 2014 seems to be things that a lot of people care about. How do you see in areas that you operate in, but then just broadly as well? As I said before, uh, there's a lot of concern. The people thinking in uh, after 2014 <clears throat> will be a problem in Afghanistan and uh, uh, maybe the investor gate problem and the security will be worse than today. But uh, as we see <clears throat> during the 30 or 32 years, what I remember, today is the, the uh, peaceful or safest time for Afghanistan. Uh, also, what we learned during the 10 years uh, from, from international people or farmers, we need to use our experience uh, in future and uh, after the NATO leave. But there is, there is an idea NATO will leave. Maybe NATO, as I said before, NATO will leave from Afghanistan. Uh, the, the military will leave, but the specialists coming in, which is we see every day, U.S. government is spending a lot of money to bring the specialists to Afghanistan, to bring the investor to Afghanistan. Uh, they are not leaving Afghanistan alone. Uh, it, will be, it will be okay, and, and uh, the business will go very well after that. And the second thing is, uh, which is Taliban, uh, Taliban and, and, and the problem creators is, is Pakistan, especially in Afghanistan. Uh, it seems Pakistan will come down uh, uh, according to the, to the agreement they are doing with the Afghan government and the requirement they have. Uh, then the problem will be solved. All the problems, which is clearly, I can say to you, uh, coming to Afghanistan, this is from Pakistan. And uh, when, when, when the United States asks him, hey, calm down, I think everything will be okay. Pakistan is, is the, the, the biggest uh, problem maker in the world, not on, only in Afghanistan. Thank you, Shikha. Um Ahmad, I wanted to kind of follow that up, uh, your first question. Uh, having done deals and, and been involved um, in Afghan financial services has done a lot of work and been really one of the primary instruments in helping get capital in. Um, what are the, generally the concerns that you've seen and how has it changed over the last couple of years from an investor standpoint of trying to get the due diligence done? Just what is the perspective and what do you hope to achieve in the future? Well, aside from the security we just discussed, um, it was answered pretty clearly. Um, business challenges uh, over, say, the last 10 years and then how we have been uh, f focusing in, in solving those problems is um, people coming to Afghanistan, opening businesses, not understanding the regulation, the tax laws, um, how to open a business, uh, what will happen to the investment and, and things like that. Um, that was a massive challenge and, and the first thing that the Afghan government did, um, as uh, Mr. Hyderi, he, he, he mentioned, they created an organization called ISA, which is basically the investment arm of Afghanistan. It's a one-shop stop where you can get your business license um, and, and a lot of the legal work done uh, within the organization. What we have done over, over the last years, and of course the government has done a lot, um, is, is to provide services to make an investor's life easier when they come to Afghanistan. We understand the realities from, from research all the way to their taxations, to their investments, to, fo to the follow-up. In, in, in looking at their performance and some companies we invest with them or co-invest with them, partnering up with them um, to basically attract the investors into Afghanistan. Um, the other thing that really attracts investors or should attract investors into Afghanistan, uh, and let's compare it to India for example, um, I was on the team at Morgan Stanley when we first established our uh, Morgan Stanley office in, 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 in India. The biggest challenge we had was the uh, capital inflow and outflow uh, out of India. It was extremely difficult. The, the regulators are very, very, very tight on how money flows in and out of India. In Afghanistan, it's pretty actually very simple. The, I remember President Karzai in, in one of his uh, uh, business promotion speeches in, in, in London, he said, we're open for business, welcome, bring in your money, invest, make money, take it out. Uh, and the recent, recent development, as in, in the last couple of months, um, uh, the Minister of Finance uh, have been trying to attract more foreign investment 
In doing so, they have been establishing regulatory environment where they can give tax holidays to big organizations, big companies to come in um, and, and, and do business in Afghanistan. Uh, so those are the things that makes Afghanistan attractive. Wahid, um, the question I wanted to ask you was along those lines, raising capital. You've been involved in task force in Afghan Pharma. We've, um, this last two years really put together trying to attract investment. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges, though, of being an entrepreneur and trying to stage business and raise capital interest in folks? And what are kind of your just experience and concerns? Uh, well, uh, yeah, for the, uh, I would say there are challenges, there are not, not challenges. Afghanistan is, uh, uh, when usually this question is raised even between us, I, I give an example of a garden. Usually, uh, as if it is a garden full of flowers, you don't know which flower to pick. So uh, uh, there are different investment opportunities in Afghanistan. The, uh, uh, the points of the investment, uh, well, because uh, there are too many invest, uh, investment opportunities there with uh, uh, focusing in different sectors, usually don't know how to pick, uh, uh, which investment to pick. Now, when it comes to the picking the investment, uh, uh, the investors, and uh, uh, then the, the challenges which we have faced so far, uh, linking to the uh, investor that we see that they are the, uh, the, the, the right investor to invest in our project and uh, uh, help us. And uh, this, was, this was so far one of the challenges. The other challenge we have uh, faced was the documentation uh, process. Uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, like most of the uh, projects, like Mr. Shakur's project or Herat Ice Cream, uh, the, 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 the investment, they, they're all from their own money, their own capital that they have invested. But how they did it, whether they did the documentation properly, the business plan, and uh, how, they, how they have foreseen that, where they will be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, what other businesses they will be involved in. Uh, th th this has been a challenge. We just jumped in and we, we, we requested the investment without uh, doing the proper documentation for that. Great. Um, mm -hmm. So these are the main challenges. Other than that, the investment opportunities, uh, there are lots of investment opportunities in Afghanistan for uh, national and international uh, uh, the traders and uh, investors. Ahmad, um, I wanted to follow up that with also asking um, what are some of the similarities that you see that exist in Afghanistan as really a pre-frontier market you think are just universal that make things maybe potentially easy or harder um, if investors are looking at Afghanistan versus a different market? What, there, there's no doubt there are certain challenges in, uh, in a conflicted um, economy. So uh, again, that aside because we have already discussed that. Uh, the challenges are very similar to, say, what you'd find in India or Africa or, or any other country. Um, what uh, makes it a bit more difficult is the stability, um, security, um, lack of trust perhaps in government and corruption to, to, to an extent. And corruption is, is fairly new to, to Afghanistan back, say, 20 years ago. Corruption wasn't as, 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 as much or affecting the business environment as much as uh, it is um, now. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it's a very similar environment. Again, security aside, um, uh, returns are expected from investments. Uh, rules and regulations are being built or created. Uh, certain laws are outdated. They're getting updated. Um, uh, the massive amount of opportunities in several different areas. Um, but again, similarities to any other third world or developing economy. Um, Afghanistan very well sits in that. Uh, Level. I would say that also from uh, the task force view and the work that we've done, um, most of the areas that we operate and um, like Mr. Hadiri said, uh, when, you, when you read the news you think of a very small portion. A lot of the work that we do is in the areas of Afghanistan where contract enforcement, rule of law, uh, security transition has already happened. Uh, the areas where these gentlemen are from are really bellwethers for what I think is on the horizon for Afghanistan because there haven't been U.S forces there for years. Um, we operate in and about. Uh, we wear a suit and tie every day and we don't wear any kind of like body armor so it's a different perspective really 
uh, the access that people actually have when they do their due diligence and uh, when they just get out um, to operate. Um, at this point, I wanted to open it up. We have a couple minutes left on the second panel and just ask what questions you have uh, for this side and the investments. Um, sure, go in the middle. take that question. We deal with it literally every single day. Our core business or one of our services that we provide at Afghanistan Financial Services, um, taxation, corporate taxes for our corporate clients. Um, majority of our difficulty is when, it, when, when, when a client, when, when you get a license when you enter Afghanistan to do business and that's good for one year. The following year you have to file your taxes, bring in what they call a clearance letter from the Ministry of Finance saying that yes, this company has paid their taxes and that here's the clearance letter and then the license gets renewed and if the license is not renewed basically you cannot do business so in order to you know when you have when you have large clients like we do um, and when some of the people at Ministry of Finance sees these large numbers uh, that are paid in taxes they figure if they're going to process the paperwork because they get such minimal income themselves they figure they they need a share of that income that this company is making Therefore, they will make it extremely challenging to get that clearance letter. They will, they will keep sending you to audit, from audit to assessment, assessment to audit. So that takes sometimes up to eight months to get it cleared. And that really hinders business. But it's, it's getting better. I mean, government is working on it. Uh, you know, foreign governments, you know, U.S. is supporting and educating and, and building capacity within the ministries to, to solve it. And, of course, that is a huge business challenge. Uh, the basic things, what, what I can see in Afghanistan, this, all the corruptions in different sections and different departments and with a different way, is the problem is there is no system. For example, we, uh, we built, we, or we brought the uh, e-payment solutions to Afghanistan. If, if you have a bill, electricity bill, you're going to the bank, uh, you you will, there is, first of all, there are seven million people living in Kabul city. There is a few banks, they're collecting the money of the electricity bill. You are standing in a very big queue uh, for two, three hours. Finally, you get to the bank officer at uh, 11.30. When you get there, he look at his uh, watch and say, oh, I'm sorry, now it's 11.30, I'm going for lunch, come tomorrow. You say, man, I, I, I was waiting here for three hours. I cannot come tomorrow. The bill you have supposed to pay, 250 hours, which is $5, but you have to pay another 500 hours, which is $10 for him. He yeah, accept your bill. Our, our uh, e-payment solution is we put the kiosk everywhere in the city. You just go to the kiosk, put your uh, bill number, and pay your money and go home. So it, it take it, uh, you save your time, save the money, and the corruption will go away. So we need to bring the system to Afghanistan, first of all. Now what we are requesting from the investor in Afghanistan, they see most of the time everything through the media. They are rich people sitting in the lobbies and looking at the TV. Uh, media is another type of the business. All the time, media just showing the bad face of Afghanistan. If, if the people go to Afghanistan and see there's not that bad security or uh, uh, problems for the investor, but we need to bring the system. The system is very important to, 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 to stop uh, corruption. Wahid, um, maybe you could talk also your, your view on uh, corruption, how it impacts you, because Afghan Pharma has operations throughout all 34 provinces, and you're a fairly large company, so you could potentially be a target for corruption. Well, uh, yeah. Usually, the, uh, we are a leading company in Afghanistan. Usually, leaders are they are always backed by some of our leaders in, in the market. Uh, I agree with the, uh, Mr. Shakur and uh, Mr. Ahmad. Uh, well, the only thing uh, uh, which has effect in, in the community. I'm, I, I was reading a, a, an article about India. India uh, has, is also a developing country and. When India changed, when actually India changed, it grew faster. It's only around 16 uh, years back when uh, India taught to work on the human resources, to educate the uh, youth 
and to educate the culture, to, to promote the culture. And this transition takes time. Now, there are two areas that uh, really uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, will be uh, concentrating is the technology, improving the, uh, the uh, brain of people, and I mean, helping people uh, get education on how to access easier to the uh, facilities, to the uh, their rights. And the, the other, uh, and it's, uh, it's the technology and the human resources. There are lots of Afghan yachts uh, out, outside Afghanistan, and uh, when they come back, they are the, uh, the, pe the people, they are the, uh, the ones who will be occupying the posts in Ministry of Finance who, has been, who are corrupted. Uh, they, they will be hired easier uh, than the, uh, the ones who have worked for a long time and uh, they usually hate systems, paperwork, they prefer to collect the money, but instead the people who are educated, with, uh, with, they come with two, three languages, with new technology, uh, the knowledge from te new technology, uh, that, that's how, I was, how, was it, how it's going to work. Great. Um, sure. Since I have the mic. <laughs> um, uh, this is questions for Mr. Tef. Um, I know you're producing a plan to ma manufacture fruits and nuts. Um, are you finding it hard to find? How, who are your buyers? What's your, who, who is buying these products? Do you find it uh, difficult to find buyers for the fruits and nuts? Yeah, uh, our session was, was supposed to be a bit shorter, so I just didn't talk about the products. I, I even brought some products here <laughs> just to show some. I didn't bring raisins, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, <laughs> I brought some saffron, some uh, uh, apricot kernel, and pine nuts. Yeah, uh, who are our buyers and who, are, uh, who we buy from. Uh, it all, all uh, again, it goes back to those security things, walking into the farmers, uh, the, to the villages, and uh, diff different, combine, I want to uh, combine different things. Our buy buyers, uh, we have buyers from India, uh, we have buyers from Europe, from, from the uh, United States, uh, how we find them. Uh, usually, the, the Afghanistan has recently believed in, uh, uh, in, in media and actually advertising the uh, products of Afghanistan through uh, exhibitions, either uh, inside Afghanistan or outside Afghanistan. And uh, in the, this kind of exhibitions, usually uh, the uh, uh, companies like, uh, like ourselves, our brand is called Morwari, which means peril. Uh, uh, we, we notice what uh, actually our buyers need is our international buyers. We, we do distribute them locally and internationally. Who our buyers are, uh, if, if they are from the U US, the first thing they ask, do you have FDA? If, if, if it is a European or again the US or any Asian, they, they uh, ask how is the facility. We know what, what the, uh, they mean by that, how we process the dried fruits, nuts, and pulses. So we, uh, this way, we, it, it encourages us to work more on the quality of our products, the quality of our, uh, uh, the, how it is processed, the facility itself, because uh, this way we, are, we, we can only send out our uh, products uh, 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 to outside Afghanistan. We have, uh, uh, the, the products are purely, purely, naturally from Afghanistan, and uh, we collect them from cooperatives, they called. Uh, each cooperative are, uh, is connected uh, to 15 farmers in a village. Uh, let's let's uh, count uh, uh, this district. In a district, you will have 50 to 80 cooperatives which are connected to the farmers. Uh, right now that I'm sitting here, my team is uh, discussing with a group of cooperatives in Afghanistan on how to collect the chickpea uh, from a specific district of Afghanistan. Uh, Herat. Yeah. Uh, um, hello, uh, this question is to Mr. Ahmed. I wanted to know how the investments <coughs> in the small, <coughs> the small medium enterprise in the energy sector are and for Indians, what the opportunities are in the energy sector, like small scale. Right. Um, as you know, Task Force focuses on SMEs predominantly. Um, uh, as I've been saying, it, uh, tons of opportunities, especially in, in, in the energy. For example, um, you know, we need to build uh, new or update grid lines uh, all around the country or introduce uh, in a much bigger way or a better way 
uh, solar power, for example. Um, in other technologies that, um, that are available around the world that can come into Afghanistan. And I think India has been, uh, for lack of a better term, a very good laboratory to see some of these great technologies actually flourish and to be able to bring those into a place like Afghanistan and be able to take advantage of technology to, to enter um, the, uh, uh, the energy uh, sector. Just like the e-payment system, for example. We you know, leapfrog over generations of what bankers used to do for bills and what have you. Now we have this. And it's lack of consumer education at this stage that it's not being used, but over time it will be used. And <coughs> that's where investment needs to be you know, made as well, to, to educate the, the consumer in understanding the technology is getting introduced, whether it's in uh, energy or whether it's in e-payment or computing or whatever it may be. Uh, yes, sir. Is it on? Yes. Okay. When I was little, you produced wonderful pomegranates. But I hear the trees have all been destroyed. If so, are the new trees being planted? I assume the soil is the same. And two, there used to be people who used to come to the door called Kabuliwala. They were money lenders. Mm -hmm. Is that ecosystem still present? Because I think it's a pretty powerful ecosystem. There's two questions. Okay. Uh, can I answer? Yes, please. Uh, uh, imagine uh, Afghanistan just like a, uh, a closed garden. Usually when you drive from one city to other, you see a lot of closed garden, you don't know what is inside. And you hear a lot of things that there are ghosts inside or there are probably very beautiful fruit inside. There are trees of uh, pomegranates, are very, uh, the pop popular pomegranates, they come from Kandahar. Kandahar is in the west and the south part of Afghanistan. And uh, there are a, lo uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, AGs, we, we call it anti government elements there. Uh, now, if, if I am buying chickpea from a cooperative, who, the cooperative is, uh, again, a, a farmer who has been selected from the guys from the same village, from the same district. These, uh, these, these guys sit to and they say why we are producing these products. They are producing to sell it and to make money. So if, if an AG comes, uh, AGs are only 5, 10, or maximum 20, or let's say 50 of them in a district. If they come to a village, you, you, don't you think they're against, uh, I mean, the whole people, the farmers, they stay in front of them. They say, we want to make business from these trees, from these products. We want to make money. This is uh, the same thing we are doing when you are, we are sitting with the farmers. We try to help them in uh, uh, telling them different stories, different uh, education. We go to the different methods to educate them on how to grow their products on how to collect their products, how much we spend uh, on, their, on their products, how it goes outside of Afghanistan. It is the image of our country. It's, it's the brand of uh, your city. This way, they come to, to the side of the businesses because for this way, they get the money, they educate their children, they, 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 they help they build the country. And uh, believe me, nobody is uh, uh, helping AGs anymore. I mean, in developing country, the insecurity never finishes. It stays some invisible. But uh, again, there are the people, the community, who will fix these things. And they, they, the education of these people to fix this, uh, it, it takes time. But for Afghanistan, I, I would say it has grown very, very fast. It has come to this level. It's very good. It's so far very good. And then uh, those uh, trees that you have heard, they are there. And if uh, I'm sure the time of pomegranate, it, it will come, you will eat the Afghan pomegranate very soon. Because now it's not only one company. It's not, there are different companies that are actually hiring those uh, gardens and they pack it in different packaging. Even the government of Afghanistan, by, by uh, supporting the uh, fast uh, release and export of these products, uh, mainly they are going to Europe and UAE. And it also comes to, goes to uh, India, uh, uh, comes to India and goes to Pakistan. Uh, so they're, they're all rumors. They just look like those ghost gardens. Look, they just you hear, but when you walk, you see that it's the best and the paradise that you have ever imagined. Um, so I believe we've, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, so I'd like just to, uh, as we conclude, uh, say thank you all for attending. Uh, one of our main objectives here at the task force, uh, we're new to this conference, was to just highlight not only what is more the truth about Afghanistan, but a lot of the commonalities that exist in any frontier market and the challenges that both investors and entrepreneurs face 
in doing um, investment opportunities. And really, at the end of the day, you have a place like Afghanistan, it's very complex, but every investment opportunity does have a, a very transformational change at the end of the day. Um, but we wanted to highlight the story that often isn't told. And I thank you for your time, so uh, we'll be around afterwards.